I would like to bid you all a very warm and sincere word of welcome this morning in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. If you're joining with us and you're visiting, you're especially welcome. It's lovely to have a brother from Scotland with us this morning, our brother Gary, who joins us from time to time. And we thank Gary for uh, making his way to the service from Glasgow this morning, and you're very, very welcome. Let's worship together as we sing the words of the very first psalm, please, psalm number one. And we're going to stand together as we sing the words of this old psalm, that man of perfect blessedness who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinner's way. Psalm number one, I'm going to ask you to stand as we worship, please.
Let's unite our hearts together, please, in prayer, and we'll seek the Lord together this morning, and we want to extend our congratulations to John and Lindsay Tate on the arrival, the safe arrival of another little baby boy, and this time it's George, and we're thankful for the safe arrival of George. He was a good weight. He was nine pounds, and we're thankful that he's healthy and well, and we'd ask you to pray for Lindsay as well and for the family circle, and we extend our congratulations as well to George and Rosemary and to various aunts and uncles that are found here this morning as well. Do pray for Frida Hamilton. Frida's still in the Ulster Hospital, and Frida just needs our prayers at this time. She's unwell, as you know. She's been recovering from surgery, and we just want you to pray that Frida will know God's grace and God's hand upon her this morning. And there's also a week of children's uh, Bible meetings this week. There's a Bible club in the Douglas Suite. So do pray for all of the workers and for Sharon Edwards especially as she brings the Word of God to the boys and girls. Pray for the children that have been reached in the week that's gone by. And do pray that God will bless richly the children's Bible club. Also, our sister Elizabeth Edwards is very busy this incoming week with, I think, three deputation meetings and pray for Elizabeth that she'll know safety in travel and she'll know God's grace as she uh, brings the deputation meetings to her various churches. Let's pray together and call upon the name of the Lord and pray for his help and speaking voice even this morning. Let's pray. Our loving God and <clears throat> our eternal Father, we quietly and <clears throat> reverently come before <clears throat> the throne of grace this morning. We do so in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We lift our hearts and we lift our voices, O God, to thy throne. And Lord, we thank thee, O God, that over the week that has gone by, we can each one testify again to the grace of God, to the faithfulness of our God. We thank thee, Lord, for thy provision in our lives every single day. We thank thee, Lord, for the knowledge of a Savior. Lord, not only in our minds, but especially within our hearts. We thank Thee, Lord, today that the child of God can lift their heart and lift their voice and testify that great is Thy faithfulness. Lord, we want to say this morning that we love Thee. We love Thee because Thou hast first loved us. We thank Thee, O God, that from before the very foundation of the world, God set His love upon us. And Lord, we pray this morning that we might ever love Thee with all of our hearts. We acknowledge, O God, that it does not lie within us to love the Lord. It does not lie within us, Lord, to serve Thee and to walk with Thee. We confess today that in our flesh there dwelleth no good thing. But Lord, we thank Thee for Thy mighty grace. And we pray that the grace of God will abound in our hearts and lives in these days. We ask, loving God, that we might see Thee as Thou art, that, Lord, Thy Word might come alive within our hearts, that, Lord God, You will cause us to be a people who love the Lord with all of our hearts and all of our souls, with all of our mind and with all of our strength. Lord, as we think about the world that we live in and as we look back through the history of our individual lives, we have to testify and acknowledge that time is going by so quickly and that our lives are just as a tale that is told. Our lives are like a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And Lord, we have one short life, one short window of opportunity in which to serve the Lord. And Father, as we look at the world around us, we see a world that is full of need. We see a world that is seemingly spiraling out of control. We thank, O oh God, of the trouble in the world today. Lord, it's on our news screens every day, and we hear, O oh God, about so much strife in different parts of the nations of the world. We thank, Lord, today of Israel and Gaza and Iran and, Lord, the Middle East today, and we cry to Thee, O oh God, that You will intervene in a special way. We think of Ukraine again. We think of Russia. We think of that awful stabbing in Australia, Lord, and people, oh God, in these days just 
seem, O oh God, to be driven to insanity, Lord, many times, O oh God, and we pray in the Savior's name that you will help us, O oh God, to live lives that tell for Jesus Christ. In this society, Lord, that's filled with fear and uncertainty and hopelessness and for many discouragement and disappointment and, Lord, even futility. And we pray, O oh God, that you will come. And, Lord, send a great awakening. Lord, send a revival to our hearts this morning. Lord, send us revival. Let it begin now in me. Gladly dethroning each rival, yield I my heart unto thee. Lord, fill our hearts with love. Give us assurance, O God, today. Give us faith, O God. Give us hope within our hearts. Let us not, Lord, be discouraged to think, O God, that, Lord, there's going to be no blessing in these days. Help us, Lord, to pray on and to labor with confidence and with assurance that our work shall be rewarded. Lord, we pray for those that are unwell. We think of Frida today. We just commit her, O God, to thyself, to thy care and keeping. Help her, Lord. Encourage her. Raise her up, Lord. Thank thee for bringing Stella Hicks home again. We pray that you'll encourage Stella. Remember Ruth Rooney today. Remember Rachel Quigley. We pray, Lord, as well for Mrs. Brown. We think of some that have been bereaved as well and just need God's help and God's grace. And Lord, at the same time, we want to express our thanksgiving for the safe arrival of little George. And we thank the Lord for the home that he's been born into. We pray that you'll bless him, Lord. May he grow and develop and just go from strength to strength. And we thank the Lord God for other babes in arms this morning in our church family. We ask, O oh God, that you will grant household salvation and grant, O oh God, that as the prophet said, our children shall all be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of our children. Lord, we look to thee. Bless Elizabeth this week as she continues her deputation meetings. We think of others, Lord. We pray for Glenn Hamilton and we pray for David McCauley and we pray, O oh God, that as they, like Elizabeth, would prepare themselves for the work of the mission field, that you'll bless them richly. And Lord, we pray that you'll provide for all of their needs. We think of the children's Bible week from Monday through to Friday. We pray, O oh Father, that thou will come in a supernatural way, maybe, O oh God, even in a way that we have never known before, and just grant, O oh loving God, that thy spirit will move. We thank thee for the power of the word of God. We thank thee for the good seed of the gospel. And we pray this incoming week as the seed of God's word is sown, that, Lord, it will find a resting place in hearts. Lord, we look to thee. We pray that you'll bless one and all this morning. Pour out thy spirit, Lord, we pray, and grant, O God, that our hearts might respond to thy truth. We pray all these things with a single eye to thy glory, giving thanks in the Saviour's name. Amen. Number 151 is our next hymn, please, 151, just as a few others are gathering. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. 151, a favorite of some in our congregation, and we're going to stand, please, as we sing this old hymn. Let's sing with all of our hearts, 151, please.
Well, as we have said already, we're delighted to see each and every one of you. We welcome you in the Lord's great name, and it's lovely as well to see our sister Maureen Waddell and Charlie out with us this morning, and we pray that God will continue to encourage you both and undertake for you this time. Lovely to have Eric Green back as well, our clerk of session, and just after Mr. Douglas reads the Word of God, we'll ask our brother Eric please to come and to bring the announcements. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. <coughs> Let us all turn to the Word of God. We're reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel and the chapter 5. While you're turning up the portion, may we give you a very warm welcome in the Lord's great name. Now, Mr. George McConnell has... Uh, really been the inspiration in producing a little book that could be called a, a short history. Yes, very short, because it gives 25 names. And there are brief glimpses of uh, the lives of these saints of God who were there at the beginning. And so that gives the title of the book, These Are the Names, comes from the book of Exodus and this is how the book of Exodus begins. Now, these are the names. And then we go on immediately into verse 2, which says, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, going right through the whole list of the 12 tribes, you see. And I have been asked to do the introduction to the book, and so I've mentioned this. This is really what gives the title to the book. These are the names. And I've said, now, God has been pleased to recognize these names in Exodus, picking out the twelve. So much so, when the high priest went into the sanctuary, he carried the twelve names on his shoulders, carried the twelve names in his heart. And then, when we all get to glory, enter into the city for a square, some may be amazed to see adorning the gates, the gates of pearl in the new Jerusalem. Yes, these are the names. God has put those names on the gates of the new Jerusalem. It just, just shows you how even the names of God's people, in this case the 12 tribes, the names of God's people are so important that he has put the names of the saints in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, this little book 12 tells the story of 25 names of the people who were there at the beginning. And I think every home represented here should have one. The book costs eight pounds, and if you could put uh, that Money in an envelope. Don't forget, put your name in the envelope and reserve for yourself a copy. When you start reading these stories of some of the saints who were there at the start of the free church, you just feel you want to go on reading and reading. And I hope that you will see to that and maybe you'll be able to get a copy. The price is eight pounds and you can keep that in mind in due course. We're reading here from Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. We'll begin at verse 13. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is speaking. Such is the quality of God's word that what we read, although it was spoken in the past, it it's given to us in such a way it may as well be spoken this instant. Let us not think of the Bible as something that merely belongs to the past and has less reference to the present. God's word is so up to date, the Lord Jesus Christ might as well be saying these words this very day. Keep that in mind as you read it. Verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the le these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled, to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word this day and the preaching of it too. Thank Dr. Douglas for reading the scriptures to us this morning. It's a great privilege to be found in a place such as this today where the scripture is read to us, where it's faithfully preached to us, and it's a wonderful blessing to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. It's a joy to welcome our brother from Scotland here this morning, and we trust that the Lord will bless him as he joins with us again in our service. And it's good that our sister Maureen is making a recovery Charlie, you must be a good nurse. Good to have him out again with us today. And uh, men get the name of been bad patients, but I trust Maureen's been a good patient. And maybe I'll give her freedom to drive again on her own shortly. Well, Mr. Maureen, good to have you here this morning. A welcome to all who are joining with us, and also those joining online as well. I trust that the service will be a real blessing. 6.20 p.m. our prayer meeting proceeds our evening service. That'll be in the prayer room of the church. Good to see a good number out for prayer again this morning of holding the Lord's servant who has the responsibility of preaching the word. 
at seven o'clock this evening, our gospel service, the Reverend Higginson, the will of God, will be bringing the word of God to us. Then there'll be a time of extended fellowship and refreshments in the new annex after the evening service. Then from seven o'clock until eight, commencing tomorrow night through to Friday, there'll be a, a children's Bible club conducted by our own workers. And this is in the Douglas Suite. Please bring your children along, pray for others, and pray for the outreach that our workers have done in the community for this work. You could also pray for our workers. Samuel Collins leads the work. Donnie Manna, Simon Dunlop, Michael Pratt, and Elizabeth Murphy are bringing the messages night after night. So please remember them in prayer. Then tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, we're having a special deputation meeting. Our brother, Mr. Glenn Hamilton, and his wife, Emma, will be along uh, to tell us about the Lord's leading in their life, how they're making preparation to go very shortly with their three young children to the land of Kenya to minister the word of the Lord there. Many young parents here will be able to relate with them, taking their young children out and preparing to take them out to Kenya. A big step indeed. Glenn's an able minister of the word of God, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing him tomorrow night. So please pull out all the stops, come along, and encourage the Lord's servants in this step that they're taking. The service will be in the main church here tomorrow night, owing to the fact that our children's meetings taking place in the Douglas Street this week. Could I appeal to you, please, as you come in tomorrow night, to fill up the centre of the church first before you sit over to the aisles. It's easier for someone standing up here speaking if the church is filled right up to the front. And I would encourage you to do that, please. Your cooperation will be greatly appreciated. 9.30 Tuesday morning, our outreach workers will meet to do some work in the community. And at 10 o'clock, our parent and toddlers group will meet in the new annex. Numbers are keeping up well, and they've been very encouraged indeed with this in the new annex. 11 o'clock on Friday, weather permitting, open air witness in Bow Street, Lisburn. And at 7 o'clock on Friday night, the junior youth are practicing for their Sunday evening junior youth service. A full attendance would be appreciated. 8 o'clock, the Senior Youth Fellowship will be in the Senior Youth Room. The speaker will be our brother, Mr. Chris Killen. Then Sunday next, 10 o'clock, our Sunday school. 10.20, the adult Bible class in the prayer room for the church, conducted by Dr. Campbell. And then the regular service times, 11.30 and 7, preaching the will of God, Reverend Higginson. Some dates for your diary. I'm sorry I'm going to mention these. It'll take a wee bit of time, but I think you should make mention of them and be aware of them. Uh, on Saturday night, the 11th of May, there'll be a youth rally in the new annex. And this is an opportunity for our youth to invite your friends along and make the meeting known. Refreshments will be provided in full details later. So please uh, take this in your heart. Saturday night's a place, uh, a time when young people might be looking for some place to go. The opportunity is provided and we trust that you'll take up that offer. Then on Saturday afternoon, the 18th of May, a new type of an informal meeting in our new annex. It's aimed at some who may from time to time struggle with some difficulty or feel isolated or alone. Here's a meeting for them to feel comfortable attending and some refreshments will be served after this meeting. There'll be friendly advisors to speak to and pray much for this. And if you share the burden, you might wish to come along as well. Then pray for all of the meetings in our church. Pray for a minister especially and his wife and family who have challenges every day, just like each one of us to carry uh, upon their hearts as well as the burdens and the work of this congregation. And uh, Reverend Higgins has been busy all week ministering in Balamone, very encouraging uh, news of the services there and attendance indeed. Then there's another announcement. It's, uh, there's a meeting the Christian Institute are organizing and it's called Transforming Truths, Christianity's Positive Impact in Our World, and a special event for 18 years to 30s. It's in Donadri Hotel on Saturday the 27th of April at 7.30 p.m. The Christian Institute's hosting these meetings for Christian young people, and Dr. Sharon James is a social policy analyst with the Christian Institute. She's the keynote keynote speaker. Uh, she has written several books, including Gender Ideology and uh, The Lies We Are Told, The Truth We Must Hold is the Subject, How Christianity Transformed the World. There will be presentations 
There will be tea and coffee and tray bakes provided. A special interview by our brother, Mr. Daniel MacArthur of Isher's Bakery. Daniel was brought up in this congregation when he was a boy in the Sunday school. And we're thrilled that the stand that he took some years ago. And then the evening will end with a question panel with the Reverend Gareth Burke and the Reverend Paul Foster as guest panelists. I'll put this up on the notice board of the church for your further attention. And then there's another announcement, a special notice for friends in Northern Ireland. It has been decided that the monthly meeting arranged for May will be held in the premises recently acquired by the Sovereign Grace Advent Testimony at Lisbon. All the details will be origi- that were originally planned for London, but the meeting will be held, God willing, on the 24th of May at 7 p.m. The subject is the righteousness of faith, Romans chapter 10, verse 5 to 13. The preacher engaged to speak is Dr. Douglas, known to us here, and uh, you take this note and put it in your diary. The address of the meeting is uh, Unit 32, Crescent Business Park, Lisbon. Uh, then we would extend our sympathy as a congregation to Brother uh, Ian Martin on the death of a sister. The Emeritus in Oma, well known to us, a real stalwart in the church there, has passed away. His funeral service will be in Oma Free Presbyterian Church tomorrow at 2 p.m. And then we'd add our congratulations to John and Lindsay Tate on the birth of George, weighing in at nine pounds, a great encouragement to the family circle, and I'm sure George Sr. will be thrilled as well. And then there's another announcement. We plan to see if we can run some pop-up Bible clubs throughout the Lisbon area from the 5th to the 9th of August. These are planned uh, during the daytime. So we're hoping some students and young people who are free during the day can go out with our children's workers. There will be a planning meeting in June, but so preparation can be made. If you can commit to help, please give your name to either Samuel Collins or Sharon Edwards. Apologize for the time it takes to make these announcements, but there's some very important announcements there. I'm going to trust you'll take them upon your heart and make them a matter of prayer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for bringing those announcements. I want to thank Dr. Douglas for reading the word of (coughs) the Lord. Uh, There was one individual that approached me in our church regarding baptism and was approached by another minister as well a week or two before that asking if we were having any baptismal services anytime soon. So if anybody is exercised about baptism, I know we've had A couple of baptismal services over the last year, which is very encouraging, and it's always encouraging that others want to go through the waters of baptism as a public declaration of their faith. So if you've never been baptized, and you've been thinking about it or praying about it, and you feel it's for you, as we believe it is, it's an ordinance that the Savior exhorts in His Word, Uh, we would encourage you to pray about that. We've no date set, but it may be later on in the month of June at some stage. So if you've been thinking or praying about baptism, please make that known and we'll have a a chat with you about that. 153 is our offering hymn, 153, our Lord is now rejected and by the world disowned, by many still neglected and by the few enthroned. 153, keeping our seats as we sing the first two verses together, please. One, five, three, verses one and two, as the offering is received.
let's stand for verse 3 only and we'll make that the last verse. Verse 3, standing. Let's turn, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and I just want to use a couple of verses from this chapter in the Sermon on the Mount to introduce our subject this morning, which is the prophetic accuracy of the Bible. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, and verse 18, the Son of God is the speaker, the preacher here, and he declares, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The prophetic accuracy of the Bible. Let's pray together and let's invite the Lord to speak to our hearts. Loving God, eternal Father, we are before thee this morning. Thy word is open before us. It's been read already. And we pray now that thou wilt be pleased, O God, to grant the movings of the Spirit of God in our hearts. Open Thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We pray that you will write thy word upon our hearts. And may we leave this place like the two on the road to Emmaus, the word of God in our hearts, our hearts burning within us, because the Lord is drawn alongside and spoken to us by the way. Grant the infilling and the anointing of thy spirit, May everything that is said and done bring honor, praise, and glory to the Savior's name. Hear and answer prayer. We ask it for the Savior's sake, for God's glory. Amen. I can remember back in 1992, sitting in what would have been called a woodwork class, but had been changed to craft, design, and technology. Our teacher was a man called Mr. Looney. And some of the old Wallace students here might remember Mr. Loney. He was one of the nicer teachers in school. He was very casual and very laid back, and they all enjoyed Mr. Loney. But one day in 1992, there had been a prediction made by someone in America that the world would end at a particular time, on a particular date, and we were sitting in that craft, design, and technology class and everybody had been talking about this date, and Mr. Looney stopped the class at the given time and allowed the class to count down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, right down to zero, and then there was a moment's silence, and I suppose everybody smiled and breathed a sigh of relief that the world had not come to an end on that particular date. And I remember Mr. Looney saying, as some were laughing, you wouldn't be so smart if all of a sudden the sky had turned red or it had got dark and there had been a clap of thunder, you wouldn't have been so smart then. Many people throughout history have foolishly tried to predict the end of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ said that no man is able to predict the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The Jehovah's Witness cult, self-styled Jehovah's Witnesses, predicted that Christ would return, the world would end in 1874. They moved it forward to 1914. They moved it forward again, 1925, then 1975, 
And then another prediction for the year 2000. Likewise, the Mormons predicted 1843 would be the end of the world. And then 1844. The Seventh-day Adventists predicted that the world would end, sorry, in 1843. And then the Mormons, 1890 or 1891. Many people are fascinated about the future. And many are interested in prophecy. Sadly, some turn to the occult and to astrology and to fortune tellers to try to work out something of what the future might hold for them and for this world. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18 and verse number 9, the God of heaven, the God of Israel, the true and living God forbids any such practices. He forbids divination. He pro, 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 or, uh, forbids observers of time, enchanters, charmers, consulters with familiar spirits, wizards, necromancers, all of these individuals that try to discern or predict the future are forbidden by the Lord. And then later on in that chapter, God warns against the false prophet. He says in verse 22, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. And in that text of Scripture, regarding the false prophet, the Bible, in a sense, is setting itself forth with all of the prophets in Scripture and all of the apostles. The Word of God is setting itself forth, and we're, in a sense, testing the Word of God by its own predictions and by its own prophecies. Over the last number of weeks, we've been bringing the Bible, as it were, to the dock. It stands accused by the world of being a book that is not God's Word, a book that is void of worthiness of our trust, a book that is written by men, not inspired by God. But we have been bringing different witnesses to testify as to the authority, the integrity, and the inspiration of Scripture. We've allowed the Bible to speak for itself and the claims that the Word of God makes about itself. Then we've considered what the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, said about the Holy Scriptures. We have also considered history and archaeology. We have thought about some great scientific truths that were revealed in the Word of God long before science discovered them. And then we have thought as well about the testimony of the church or individual believers about the authority and the integrity of God's Word. And today we're calling another witness to the stand, the prophetic witness. And we're going to consider very simply and very quickly some of the great prophecies in the Word of God that show us that the Scriptures must be and are what they claim to be, the inspired Word of an eternal God. Jesus Christ our Lord said here in Matthew chapter 5 that the prophetic Scriptures and the Word of God, and the law of God, and every jot and every tittle ultimately will be fulfilled. Let's consider for a few moments some Old Testament prophecies that have been fulfilled already. Now, there are far too many to mention here, but we're going to consider some interesting Old Testament prophecies given long before their fulfillment but have subsequently been fulfilled and have come to pass. For example, in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, we have the great dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And that dream concerns a great image that the king Nebuchadnezzar saw. And Daniel came and not only interpreted the king's dream, but showed the king what the dream actually was without the king revealing it unto him. And he speaks about this great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. 
It says in Daniel 2 and 32, the image's head was of fine gold, the breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And throughout the remainder of that chapter, Daniel begins to explain the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The head of that great image represented Nebuchadnezzar's present kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, at that particular time. And then the rest of the image represented empires that would rise up after the kingdom of Babylon had been destroyed in that generation. And all of the prophecies that Daniel gave have ultimately come to pass. The head of gold represents Babylon. And Daniel predicted that Babylon would be destroyed, and Babylon was destroyed. And then the great breast of silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire, which rose up on the heels of Babylon, and it has come to pass as well. And then the belly of brass represented the uh, Greco-Macedonian Empire that came up after Persia. And Daniel predicted that, and it has come and gone. And then the legs of iron represented the Roman Empire. And the prophetic scriptures in the book of Daniel predicted the rise of the Roman Empire more than 500 years before it came to its ascendancy. And all of those kingdoms rose, and all of those kingdoms fell, according to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, long before they were ever even on the horizon. And then the feet of iron and clay represent, I believe, a kingdom yet to come, a coming together of the iron and the clay, a revived Roman or a revived Babylonian empire that will rise up again in the last days and will ultimately be destroyed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With the exception of the feet, the head, the breast, the belly, and the legs have all risen and have all fallen according to the prophetic scriptures found in Daniel chapter 2. And then in the prophecy of Isaiah, there's a very interesting prophetic statement given in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 28 that speaks of a king called Cyrus. Now, this king had not yet been born, but his name is given. And God says, Cyrus is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now, the temple had already been built by Solomon. But this prophetic scripture indicates that the temple would need to be rebuilt, and that is stating that the temple would ultimately be destroyed or defiled or broken down. And in the prophetic scriptures in the book of Isaiah and elsewhere, you've got predicted the rise of Babylon, that Babylon would surround Jerusalem, that the Jewish people would be taken captive, that the Babylonians would ultimately be defeated by the Persians, and a Persian king would arise and would allow the children of Israel to return to the city of Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. And that scripture is given there in Isaiah 44, Explained further in chapter 45, some 150 years before their fulfillment. And you've got the fulfillment of Cyrus rising up. His name's given in Isaiah. 150 years later, we are introduced to him in the Scriptures. And in the book of Ezra, the first chapter, we read all about how Cyrus allowed the children of Israel to return from their 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And many prophetic scriptures were being fulfilled and have been fulfilled that were given by Isaiah and Jeremiah and others. And then the prophet Ezekiel speaks about a great city called the city of Tyre, which was one 
of the most famous sea port cities in ancient biblical times. And the prophet Ezekiel said that the city of Tyre in Ezekiel chapter 26 would be defeated. It would be opposed by many nations. It would become a flat rock. It would become a place for the spreading of nets. And it would never, never be fully rebuilt. You can read all about that in Ezekiel chapter 26. Verse 3 through to verse number 6, the city of Tyre, the walls will be destroyed, the towers will be broken down, it will be made like the top of a rock, it shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. Now whenever Ezekiel gave that prophecy, the city of Tyre was still a very lucrative and a very popular city and a seafaring city. And yet Nebuchadnezzar came and defeated the city of Tyre. And then in 330 BC, several hundred years after the prophecy was given, Nebuchadnezzar the Great came in and completely flattened the city. And it actually became a place for the spreading of nets. And there are many such like prophecies in Old Testament Scripture that were given and were fulfilled before the commencement of the New Testament. But some of the most amazing prophecies and some of the most striking Old Testament prophecies that have been fulfilled concern our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you remember how the Lord said in John 5 and 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think that ye have life, and they are they that testify of me. And he pointed his day and generation to the Old Testament scriptures that had been completed 400 years before his birth in Bethlehem. And we have often mentioned how the Lord drew alongside the two in the road to Emmaus and beginning at Moses and at all the prophets, he spoke unto them the things concerning himself. And whenever you correlate some of those great prophecies, they point us with pinpoint accuracy to the person of Jesus Christ being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. If we had never met before, you and I, and yet we had been corresponding, maybe through email or maybe through text message, and for some reason you wanted to meet me, and we arranged for a specific time, and a specific place, maybe a, a smaller place, maybe not the city hall or some place like that, but we arranged to meet in some small village outside some small shop, and I described myself to you, and that description might be open for debate, but if I says I'm about 15 stone weight, I'm about six foot three, I used to have dark hair, it's getting a little bit more gray, I'm 46 years of age, and I describe the clothes that I'll be wearing. I'll, I'll wear a, a navy jacket. I'll be wearing a red tie. I'll be wearing a blue shirt. I'll be wearing dark trousers. I'll be wearing brown shoes. I'll put blue laces in them. I'll wear red socks. I'll be standing with a dog. It'll be a fox red Labrador, about five years of age. And I'll meet you in such and such a place at such and such a time. And I'll be standing beside a red post box. And there'll be a, a gray Volkswagen Golf on the other side. If you were to go to that place at that particular time and meet someone of that description, you would be absolutely sure and certain that it was me. Because it would be impossible for all of those things to come together. Now, in a much more remarkable way, dozens and dozens of prophecies were given to the children of Israel concerning their Messiah. One of the most remarkable would be his virgin birth. Genesis 3.15 says he would be the seed of the woman. Isaiah 7.14 says a virgin shall conceive. And that great prophecy was fulfilled whenever the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said she would conceive and bring forth a son. And immediately Mary said, How shall this thing be, seeing I know not a man? The virgin birth. Genesis 49 says that he will come from the tribe of Judah. And we see that fulfilled in Luke 3 and 33. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 said, 
he would be born in Bethlehem. And that's fulfilled in Matthew 2, verse number 1. Jeremiah 31, 15 says, coinciding with his birth, there would be a great massacre of infants under a tyrant king. And that prophecy was fulfilled, Matthew 2 and verse 16. Isaiah chapter 9 says he would have his ministry round about Galilee primarily. And that, of course, was fulfilled in all of the Gospels. Isaiah 53 said he would be despised and rejected of men. John chapter 1 opens with the words, He came to his own, and his own received him not. Zechariah 11, 12 said he would be sold not for 29 pieces of silver or not for 31 pieces of silver, but he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And that prophecy was fulfilled in Matthew 26, 15. We were even told in the Old Testament that the money that was used to sell him would purchase a potter's field. And that was fulfilled in the New Testament as well. The prophet Isaiah said he would be silent whenever he was confused, whenever he was accused, and that was fulfilled in Matthew 26, 62 to 63. Isaiah 50, verse number 6 says, he would be spat upon. And of course, that was fulfilled in Mark 14, 65. Psalm 22, 16 says, his hands and his feet would be pierced. It was a prophecy concerning his crucifixion, a form of punishment that was not to the fore until the Roman Empire arised, and that was fulfilled in John 20, 27. Isaiah 53, 12 said, he would be numbered with the transgressors. And we see in the Gospels that he was crucified between two thieves. Psalm 69, 21 said, he would be given vinegar to drink. And that was fulfilled upon the cross whenever they offered him vinegar to drink. Psalm 22 said that whenever he was being crucified, the crucifiers would take his garments and divide them and cast lots for them. And we see that fulfilled whenever the Roman soldiers took his garments and began to cast lots for them. Psalm 22, 1 said he would be forsaken. That was fulfilled in Matthew 27, 56. Psalm 16, 10 says he would be resurrected. That was fulfilled in Matthew 28, 9. Psalm 66, 18 says he would ascend back into heaven. That was fulfilled in Matthew 24, 50 and 51. The Word of God also said in the Old Testament that he would ride into Jerusalem on a coat. It says his visage, his face, his countenance would be marred more than that of any man. It also said he would be buried in a rich man's grave. Now you take all of those prophetic statements, every single one of them given more than 400 years before the birth of the Savior. And the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, fulfilled them all and many, many more and fulfilled each one of them literally. And surely that shows us the prophetic accuracy of the Old Testament Scriptures. There's no chance at all that those prophecies could be fulfilled in the way that Christ fulfilled them. And that's not to mention the laws that He fulfilled that pointed to the cross and pointed to the Savior. And all of the great types and shadows, the tabernacle, the temple, the great high priest, the feasts, the various offerings that all pointed to the Savior, and He fulfilled them perfectly. And so you see all of these great witnesses coming together, showing us the accuracy of the prophetic scriptures. Now I want to ask you this morning, what's your verdict? Do you agree with the historical testimony of scripture? The archaeological testimony of scripture? The scientific testimony of scripture? The prophetic testimony of scripture? What the Savior said about the scriptures? What the Bible says about itself, you would have to have a very strong argument to reject the Word of God, given some of the Old Testament prophecies already fulfilled. And then there are many prophecies in the Word of God that have been fulfilled since the completion 
of the New Testament. For example, in Matthew 24, 2, the Lord Jesus Christ predicted the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And whenever he made that statement, many people stood amazed. How could this great temple be destroyed? The Savior actually said that every brick would be taken down, brick by brick. And in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was taken down brick by brick. The prophecy was fulfilled. The dispersal of the Jewish people was spoken of many times in the Old Testament in Zechariah 13, 7. It says, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. The book of Ezekiel chapter 36 speaks about the Jews being dispersed amongst all nations. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, after AD 70, the Jews were dispersed throughout the whole earth. And yet the remarkable thing is that all the while they were able to keep their identity. You take any other people group and they get dispersed among the nations. Within a generation or two, their identity has all but gone. But somehow the Jewish people were able to keep and preserve their very identity. Ezekiel 37, among other prophetic scriptures, predicts and foretells the restoration of the nation of Israel. And in spite of all of the atrocities under, under Hitler in the Second World War in 1948, against all odds, humanly speaking, Israel became a nation again. God kept His promises. God fulfilled His prophecies. The prophet of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, and verse number 4, speaks about the time of the end, the last days. And it says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And Daniel is speaking there about the increase of travel and the increase of knowledge in the last days. And 100 years ago, it would have seemed to be an absolute impossibility that you could have traveled from one end of the earth to another in less than 24 hours. And yet we take it for granted now that you could leave Northern Ireland and be in Australia within a 24-hour period. It's remarkable. Travel has been increased. Many are traveling to and fro. People are no longer confined to the nation of their birth. People are traveling across the world all the time, every day, for decades now without intermission. And of course, knowledge has been increased as well. And the 20th century gave rise to much scientific and medical discovery. And now we've got the world at our fingertips with the internet. And you can go on to some of the search engines and you can find almost any information that you want in any given subject within just a moment or two. And then in Matthew's Gospel 24, we've got that great prophetic chapter, the Olivet Discourse. In verses 4 and 5, the Son of God said that false Christs and false prophets would arise and deceive many. And it wasn't really until the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that you had the rise of many, many cults that came in the name of Christ. The Mormons, the Russellites, the Christadelphians, the Christian scientists, the Seventh-day Adventists, the rise of the charismatic movement, the rise of the ecumenical movement, false Christs, false prophets, false teachers, deceiving and being deceived. Verses 6 and 7 speak about wars and rumors of wars. They told us that the First World War would be the great war that would end all wars. And within just a couple of decades almost, there was the Second World War. And many people believed that during the Second World War, the world would be so sick and sore and tired of war and strife that there would be peace treaties that would end all wars. And there's been more wars across the world since the Second World War than at any other period in history. Verse 7 of Matthew 24 predicts famines, a rise in famine, as it does a rise of disease and pestilence. 
and we've got more sickness and more disease physically, emotionally, medically than in any other time in world history. We're told as well that there'll be earthquakes in divers places. Verse 9 says that many would be afflicted and killed because of their faith and that both Jews and Christians would be hated of all nations for the Lord's sake. And we have got more martyrs now than ever before. Verse number 12 predicts a, an awful falling away. The iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. Need we elaborate? We are living in a day of tremendous falling away from the faith. Even over the last three or four years, many seem to have departed from the churches right across the evangelical church in the West. Many are falling away. Verse 14, however, speaks about the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations and all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And the gospel now is being promoted and shared in places where it seemed impossible that the gospel would ever reach. And more and more people are hearing the gospel now than ever before. Friends, it's like reading tomorrow's newspaper. Scripture, biblical prophecy is not written in riddles. It's written clearly. It's there in black and white for all to see. And all of those great Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled literally. All of the prophecies we've mentioned about Jerusalem and the Jewish people and Israel and in Matthew 24 fulfill literally. And I believe prophetic scriptures that still have to see their fulfillment will be fulfilled literally. And in the closing moments, time is gone. But let's think just for a moment or two about some prophetic scriptures that are still to be fulfilled. And it seems that the stage in our world is being set for the fulfillment of more tremendous biblical prophecies. For example, in Matthew 24 and verse number 21, after the Lord gives all of those preliminary signs, birth pangs, if you like, the world in upheaval, he says in verse 21, then shall be great or the great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be. Jesus Christ our Lord, along with men like Daniel and men like Jeremiah, predicted a time of trouble and spoke about a time of tribulation in the world at the end time age. Jeremiah speaks about Jacob's trouble. The prophet Daniel in Daniel 12, verse number 1 speaks about the end time, and he says there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, a time of trouble. Jesus Christ talked about the time of great tribulation. And friends, I don't see any real evidence in the Bible that the church is going to be snatched away secretly and quietly and silently before this trouble begins. If you read through Matthew chapter 24, the Lord seems to make it very clear that during that time of tribulation, during that time of trouble, God's people are still there. A time of tribulation, a time of trouble. Scripture also predicts the rising of a man of sin. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you read about the rising up of a man of sin who opposes God and opposes his Christ and stand against the Lord's anointed. A man who sets himself to be a, a deity within his own right, he believes. And he'll sit in the temple of God and he'll sit in the holy place. The Bible calls him the man of sin. The Word of God calls him the beast. The Scripture calls him the son of perdition. The Bible calls him the Antichrist or the, the little horn. You can read about him in great detail in the closing chapters of Daniel. Also Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 14. And at the same time, there's going to be a great, a great movement against God. The Bible says as well in Romans 11 that there's going to be a great revival amongst the Jewish people. And the Jewish people will be restored. 
and grafted in again, and God will save a multitude of Jewish people on a grand scale so much that the world will wonder. And coinciding with that, and prior to that, there's going to be a, a contract, I believe, made with Israel in the last days, a contract that will be broken. Study the prophetic scriptures. And then the Bible speaks about Christ's coming. And the Bible says His coming will be visible. His coming will be personal. His coming will be literal. His coming will be glorious. His coming will be with ten thousands upon ten thousands of angels. Coinciding with His coming, there's going to be a great resurrection. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where indwelleth righteousness. There's going to be a lake of fire for all who know not God and obey not the gospel. There's going to be a judgment for saints, the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be a great white throne judgment for all who do not know God. And the Bible says the dead in Revelation 20, small and great, will stand before God and the books will be opened. And beloved, I believe if all of those prophetic scriptures that spoke about Christ's first coming were fulfilled literally and fulfilled to the jot and to the tittle, so it will be with the prophetic scriptures concerning his second coming. And the great challenge is today, are we ready? Are we ready as Christians? Are we abiding in Him? Are we watching and waiting? Are we working and witnessing? Are we worshiping and walking with our Savior? But maybe this morning you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you're far from God this morning. You're in God's house. You're among God's people. You're under God's Word. But you've never really been born again. You've never trusted Jesus Christ. You've never turned from your sins. And if the Savior was to come back, you would not be ready. It's time to take God's word at face value. It's time to obey its precepts. It's time to respect its prophecies. It's time to claim its promises. It's time to live for the person of Jesus Christ. Friends, today the Bible is a book that we can trust. Humanly speaking, it's an inexplicable book. The only explanation for the Bible is divine inspiration. May God write his word upon our hearts today. And let's just unite our hearts together in prayer as we close out this meeting. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless his word to our hearts. And let's just have a word of prayer together. Let's call upon the Lord. And maybe God has spoken to your heart. God's word has gone forth this morning in weakness. We trust that we'll find a resting place in your heart and in mine. And if God has challenged your heart and you need to get right with God, do that this morning. Don't leave your pew until you've called upon the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee today for this wonderful book that God has given. We thank thee, O God, for all of these great witnesses that testify to the integrity of God's Word. We thank Thee that this is a book that we can trust. We thank Thee, Lord God, for all of these great prophecies fulfilled, some yet to be fulfilled, and we know that our God is faithful. Help us, Lord, to walk with Thee. Help us to love Thee and to serve Thee, and grant, O God, today that we might be ready, watching and waiting, working and witnessing, whenever Jesus Christ comes back again. Hear and answer prayer and part us now with thy fear and with thy favor and with thy blessing. We humbly pray with thanksgiving in the Savior's great and worthy name. Amen.